Good morning, everybody. We want to welcome you to today's National Wilderness Stewardship Alliance webinar presented in collaboration with the Partnership for the National Trail System. I'm Randy Welsh, the National Wilderness Stewardship Alliance's Executive Director. We're here today with the NWSA webinar series, The Stewardship Challenges, um, designed to help stewardship organizations to operate more efficiently in their office, as well as providing expert advice for wilderness stewardship community professionals on operational issues that all groups face. Uh, these are free webinars where we want to keep you aware of funding opportunities, policy changes, ways to strengthen and to build your stewardship group. As we go through the Stewardship Challenge series, we'll bring to you different webinars about partnership opportunities to uh, involve your group with, We'll bring you tips and how-tos on ways to make your group more effective. Um, we have a, a, a large lineup, a, a full lineup this year of webinars that are going to be scheduled for the first Tuesday of every every month, uh, second Tuesday of every month, um, starting in January. That information will be on our website, and we'll talk a little bit more about January's webinar at the end of our program today. We are pleased and honored to have as our presenter, Darcy Shepard, a Friends of Nevada Wilderness. She's the Director of Finance and Human Resources, and she'll lead off our webinar series with the webinar on managing your organization's finances, best practices for end of the year accounting and reporting. Now Darcy, who was elected the NWSA Treasurer in 2012, has a passion for both the numbers and outdoors. Um, she holds a BA in Journalism and Political Science with a Certificate of Excellence in Nonprofit Management, both from the University of Nevada, Reno in 2014. This webinar will help your organization start 2019 off on the right foot fiscally. Darcy will be reviewing the best financial practices, including advice on building your budget for 2019, tracking your unrestricted fund, and what it takes to prepare for and undergo an audit. This will help set your organization up for success, whether you've got a budget of 10,000 or 1 million, and will help you, this, this webinar will, will help you accomplish your financial goals as an organization. So Darcy, I'm gonna turn it over to you in just a second. Um, as we go through the webinar, um, the webinar is structured in several sections, and as we get to the end of each section, we'll stop and Darcy will answer questions from the audience. If, as an attendee, you have any questions, please go ahead and type those into the question field that you'll see um, in your uh, GoToWebinar dashboard. Um, we'll try to answer those as we get to them in each of the particular sections, and then at the end of the um, webinar, if there are any unanswered questions, we will take that and make that happen. So Darcy, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you now. All right, thanks, Randy. So my name is Darcy Shepard, and as Randy said, I am the Director of Finance and Human Resources at Friends of Nevada Wilderness. I've been working with Friends of Nevada Wilderness for eight years after doing a one-year stint as a Stewardship AmeriCorps volunteer. I'm also the outgoing treasurer of the National Wilderness Stewardship Alliance. Um, I have an experience with growing financial processes with expanding budgets and organizations. With Friends of Nevada Wilderness, we've grown from a $770,000 budget to a $1.3 million budget under my management. We have 13 full-time employees and 12 seasonal crew members, and we've been around since 1984. The National Wilderness Stewardship Alliance has grown from a $32,000 budget to over $500,000 during my tenure. Uh, we have one contract part-time executive director who just did a wonderful intro for me. Thank you, Randy. And we've been around since 2010. Today, we're really going to look at good tips and tools for organizations at all stages and sizes. Some of these may be a good fit for your organization, and some may not. The key to success is developing financial best practices that work for you and obviously comply with your funders and with the government. So our agenda for today, we're gonna to go through an intro, uh, which we are just wrapping up. 
We're going to look at the tools in my toolbox. We're going to look at building your budget in a few different ways. We're going to look at individual program and organization wide budgets, as well as unrestricted income, employee costs and indirect costs. Then we're going to talk about developing audit ready systems and go over some year end compliance reminders. So first up, the tools in my financial toolbox. We use QuickBooks accounting software and we have a strategy that we've developed over the past 20 years that really works for us and shows what we want to see. We've established where and how information is categorized within the program, what data we want captured in relation to each transaction, what reports we want to see and what reports we regularly display for our program staff and our board. And we make sure that we follow this consistently. Uh, this is particularly important when you're looking at year after year comparisons. If one year you're capturing all your fuel costs together under the travel line, and then the next year you add a new line under program supplies to capture fuel costs, you won't be able to run an easy comparison report one year to the next, which is something that can be very useful. We also have a Friends of Nevada Wilderness Grants Guide. This helps ensure our staff follows a uniform standard when writing grants. For example, we all write into the budget the same rate for our Northern Nevada Stewardship Coordinator, for our indirect costs, and for other organization-wide costs. This also helps put finance and programs folks on the same page. We know who tracks what and who reports on what. And it helps really bring us together and share the grant responsibilities. And also by having this guide in paper, when we bring on new staff or when someone is promoted and is going to be managing a grant, we have a guide we can hand them that they can easily reference that ensures we're all on the same page. And if somebody isn't following the guide, we can point to it and ask why not. Another tool in my toolbox is a very strong partnership with our accounting and auditing firm. While I am the Director of Finance and Human Resources, we also have an outside auditing and accounting firm that helps us with the high end financials um, including our, the filing of our taxes. With a $1.3 million budget, we really need to ensure that our financial reports to the IRS are 100%. And so we make sure to contract to have those done. Um, we have a partnership with Cone and Company here in Reno. For the last seven years, they've been coming in and they spend about two weeks doing uh, auditing field work with us and really helping us develop our systems. Um, this is an independent audit. This is not a uh, federal single A133 audit, which we'll talk about a little later. And the way we found Cone and Company was actually through our community foundation. We have um, a community foundation up here in Western Nevada that was offering grants um, to help develop solid financial systems and the operation side for nonprofits. And we applied, they had a list of recommended accountants and we selected Cone and Company and have been absolutely thrilled. So if you're looking for an auditor or an accountant, check with your community foundations, check with your fellow nonprofits. They can be a great resource. The other tool that we have that is extremely important is a well-defined mission and a written tracking terminology. So as you can see, the way Friends of Nevada Wilderness looks at our programs is the way they fit into our mission. When we talk about preserving all qualified Nevada public lands as wilderness, protecting all present and potential wilderness from ongoing threats, that red underline, we're talking about our protection campaigns and where those happen and how they're funded. 
when we are looking at informing the public about the values and need for wilderness, that's our outreach and education program. When we are talking about restoring and improving the management of wild lands, that's our stewardship program. This really helps us avoid mission creep because when we look at applying for grants or funding sources, we ask ourselves, do these fit into one of our three program areas that are tied to our mission? If, they're, if they do, we're good to go. If not, then we wanna have a further discussion about that. This also allows us to sort our programs and activities into trafficable categories that may have multiple funding sources. For instance, our forest volunteer program, we have a few different funding sources that support that particular area. For our protection campaign um, for Fallon Defense, we only have our Patagonia Fallon funding. This also enables us to evaluate for and track matches. If we are looking at expanding our trail crew program, we may look at what funds that and ask ourselves, is there a good match here? One of the other key pieces we have is a fiscal policy and a roles narrative. This provides the who and what of money, money handling and all adjacent tasks. This includes payroll processing, bank reconciliation. This covers picking up an opening process for mail because when your donors are sending checks in the mail, you need to ensure that that is accurately being captured open, that there's no potential for fraud. We have our invoicing strategy for grants, a list of allowable indirect costs. All of these things have been written down and agreed upon by the leadership team at Friends of Nevada Wilderness. This helps us know who's doing what, who's responsible for what, and make sure that we are avoiding the potential for fraud and that we have the proper controls because that's one thing an auditor will look for. Is there a potential for fraud? Is the same person who is writing the checks, signing the checks, and mailing the checks? Hmm, maybe let's add another person in there to make sure that there's two people watching, two people involved. For instance, in the check, uh, check writing process, as director of finance, I write the checks. As the executive director, um, our, our executive director, Sharon Otherton, signs them. That ensures that uh, we have the proper controls. Our auditor has approved that, and we have written that as part of our fiscal policy and roles narrative. So if either Sharon or I leave the organization, it's understood that that position still has that role and those controls are still there regardless of the people in the position. All right, so do we have any questions about tools in our toolbox? Let me open up our questions panel. So as far as how often um, an audit is recommended, we get our audit done annually. Now, when you are required to do an A133 single audit from the government, um, which happens once you are receiving $750,000 in federal funds in any 12 month period, you will be required to do an audit for each of those 12 month periods. Um, we are funded by both Charitable Trust and the National Forest Foundation, which ask us for a copy of our annual audit. So we do an audit annually. Finding a good accounting firm. We were very lucky with uh, having some, some guidance from the Community Foundation. So I would definitely recommend getting in touch with fellow nonprofits. And if you have a local community foundation or a statewide community foundation, that would be a good place to start as well. Um, check with your board members. Maybe as tax season comes up and they're visiting their accountants, they can ask, hey, do you, do you work with nonprofits? Do you have some advice or some recommendations for solid um, accounting firms that understand the ins and outs of nonprofits? I would say that um, outsourcing your accounting to a uh, bookkeeping and related services firm 
that is definitely an option. A lot of organizations, until they hit that $1 million mark, it's hard to have a full-time finance person on that isn't also, say, an associate director type that has a lot of other duties. Um, that is a great option for smaller nonprofits. And I actually highly recommend it, particularly when it comes to your taxes, because they have the experience that you don't. A lot of us are volunteers. A lot of us are conservationists first before we're tax filers, unless you're uh, lucky enough to have an accountant on your board. So I highly recommend outsourcing to a good bookkeeping firm once you've found someone who has experience with nonprofits. Finding board members with uh, financial experience. We are still developing on that one. Um, I would say, again, look at your network. Um, are there people, maybe your volunteers? Um, are there folks that are retiring from the agencies that maybe have you know, a grants and agreements background? Look at some of those folks in your network. Um, and also look at some of the folks who maybe aren't out on the ground, but are supporting conservation. Look at your donor list. Um, I know that a lot of times it's harder to find folks who have the financial background in the um, conservation world because a lot of us are outdoors people first. So sometimes we're a little harder to find, um, but just start asking around if you know um, ask your volunteers, is anyone an accountant? Um, and start building the ladder of engagement. Um, start bringing, you know, if you know an accountant that you're really looking at, maybe ask them out on a stewardship trip. Um, really try to recruit them to your cause. And yes, this webinar is being recorded. So as far as how much an audit costs, we um, have a cap set at our audit where a cone company will charge us no more than 18000 which, yes, it is a, uh, a, a pretty hefty price tag, but um, we definitely think that it is worth it. And we have a few generous general support grants that have helped pay for our audit, um, particularly with the Wilberforce Foundation. All right, and the uh, last question kind of uh, relates to uh, larger versus small organizations, which I am going to table until after our building the budget section. All right, on to building your budget. First, I just wanted to review a couple pieces of vocabulary. Remember that gross is total before expenses and your net is your total after expenses. And when I talk about a funding source, I'm referring to a grant restricted donation of other or other source of income that is tracked. Um, why don't I just call it a grant? Well, because more than just grants need to be tracked. Sometimes you'll get restricted donations from members and businesses. Um, sometimes you'll get income from a restricted ask. Say you do a year-end flee and you specifically tell donors that you will spend all of that money rehabbing a trail in a certain wilderness area where well, you need to make sure that that goes to that certain project. Um, and so you want to make sure that you have a restricted funding source that you are tracking for that. For example, funding source types at Friends of Nevada Wilderness include business contributions, corporate grants, foundation grants, government grants and agreements individual donations, merchandise income, events income, and endowments and investment gains. Unrestricted income is membership, business donations, and other income that is not restricted by the agreement or donor to a specific program. This is a type of funding source, um, and we'll talk about it a little more building your budget. A lot of, uh, a lot of organizations have a tougher time tracking their unrestricted income. So I would recommend making sure that as you're setting up your accounting system, that you're looking at how do you wanna track those donations that come in that aren't government agreements that may need annual reports. 
How do you want to present that? How do you want to build that into your budget? And then again, um, when I refer to a program, I'm talking about a type of service or work being provided, like a stewardship, um, like stewardship or educational outreach that generally remains the same year to year. And then a project would be an individual event, like a leave no trace workshop. Um, for an example, uh, a program at Friends of Nevada Wilderness is the restoration of the Black Rock High Rock National Conservation Area, and a project would be picking up trash at the popular Trago Hot Springs in the NCA. Next up, as you build your budget, you will need to know a few things. One, what are you obligated to spend your money on? Two, if you have funds that, it, that aren't obligated by donors agree, or agreements, what do you want to spend that funding on? The timeline you need to spend your funding in. A lot of times we will get grants that run multiple years or run, say, June to May. Um, so we will need to look at how much are we expecting to expend in that particular budget period and how much are we expecting to roll or defer to the next year. Um, make sure you know your reporting requirements. It's really important to stay in fiscal compliance, um, and this includes with both the IRS and with your funders. So as you're building your budget, make sure you're also looking at when you need to report on the funding. You also need to know the nature of your funding, um, particularly is it federal funding with a CFDA catalog of federal domestic assistance number? Um, no, that, that does not always come from a federal agency. The reason knowing whether or not it is federal funding is important is again, at $750,000 of federal funding in a calendar or in a 12 month period, you will be obligated to undergo a federal audit. When I look at a budget, I like to, when I look at our annual budget, I like to look at it in three different ways. First is by a single funding source. So this is a single grant, a single agreement, a single donation, just a small piece of our budget. For example, this is a budget for the Friends of Humboldt Poyabi National Forest um, Forest Service Program Agreement, the Native Seedlings Planting. They have given $20,000 and it is broken down in, uh, in these expenses. And so this allows you to look at, um, to see which programs are fully funded. Um, if you have money for two trail crews, um, but no executive director, it's going to be a rocky season. So as you look at each of your budget pieces, um, you're going to slowly combine them. Next up, we will look at a program budget, which combines similar funding sources. So we have our Forest Service Program Agreement from the last slide. And then we also have a grant from the National Forest Foundation. And then we have a little bit of unrestricted funding that we've thrown in there because we've committed to match um, to our Forest Service Program Agreement. So then we can look at the total budget for our stewardship planting program to ensure that our employees are paid for, our costs are all there, and whether or not there are any holes. Next, I take each of the single source budgets and each of the program budgets and build them into an organization wide budget. This helps us look at all of our costs across the organization, whether it's for our programs, whether it's for our administration, and it makes sure that we include all staff and all costs for an organization. So in this example, for the Friends of the Humboldt Poyabi National Forest, we have an executive director and a programs coordinator we have uh, an annual newsletter and an educational leave no trace pamphlet and we have program supplies and travel that all goes to our um, various programs and our deliverables and when we look at that over in column J we have the total which would be our organization-wide budget 
Now you'll see I've budgeted for our unrestricted income in column I. We'll get a little, we'll get into that just a little bit more in a moment. So how do I budget unrestricted income? First, I sit down with our leadership and I ask a few questions. I ask, what are we committed to matching to grants? What fundraising or admin costs aren't covered by other sources? What are our programmatic priorities for the year? What programs have shortfalls? And which programs do we want to build? So in this example, our costs are going to be split between our fundraising and administration and our stewardship match that we have promised for that Forest Service spa. And so then you'll see that we have combined this into an unrestricted budget that covers both, which we then put into our organization-wide budget from the previous slide. Now, how do you know how much everything costs? Well, there's an Excel chart for that too. When we look at employee costs, oftentimes we can look at just salary and think of folks as, all right, well, their gross salary is 50,000 a year, that's their cost. There's a lot more to employee costs that go in, so you wanna make sure you're capturing those so you can bill your grants adequately. So in this example, we're making sure to include the salary, the health benefits, and the retirement for our executive director and our programs coordinator. So we know their total cost. So then when we do our budget, we can make sure that we have covered both our executive director and our programs coordinator for the year. Now you'll notice in this example, I've left off employer taxes and accounting fees to streamline, but definitely don't forget those because they can sneak up on you. Another area that can sometimes be mysterious is capturing your indirect costs. Indirect costs are those costs not readily identified with a specific project or organizational activity, but incurred for the joint benefit of both projects and other activities. Indirect costs are usually grouped into common pools and charged to benefiting objectives through an allocation process or an indirect cost rate. So essentially what those are, those are costs like rent, where your executive director, your stewardship team, your education team, everyone benefits from having an office. And so those go into an indirect cost pot. Now the benefit to this is that you can charge your grants, particularly federal grants, an indirect cost rate. Now how do you negotiate that indirect cost rate? There's three different billing options. So Friends of Nevada Wilderness uses the 10% de minimis rate allowed under our federal agreements. And we do this across the board for all our grants. It's easy, it's simple. 10% goes into the indirect pot from everything, unless it's not allowed in the, um, in the funding agreement. There's also the option to have an approved indirect cost allocation plan. Now, the unfortunate part of this is it must be submitted and approved with each agency agreement. So you may run into a situation where the BLM, the Lake District, has okayed your, your indirect cost allocation plan, but the Humboldt Poyabi Forest has not. So that's a downside of the approved indirect cost allocation plan. You also have the option of a negotiated indirect cost rate agreement. Some of you may have heard of it called a NICRA. This is federal government wide, which is nice. It's up there, it's, uh, you just submit it with each agreement. Um, most foundations and corporations also recognize this rate so you can apply it across the board. One of the big drawbacks, there is a lot of paperwork and legwork to negotiate this rate and establish it with the federal government. And then there's maintenance to ensure that you did not have, um, that there's not an inconsistent billing there. One year, uh, for example, one year you didn't have indirect cost of 18%. The next year you're having 13%, but you're still billing at 18%. So there's maintenance involved in the negotiated indirect cost rate agreement. And generally folks 
contracts with an accounting and auditing firm to establish that with the federal government unless you've got an accounting expert on your board. All right, I'm going to check the questions now that we're through that section. Hey, Randy. I think you're still on mute. Oh, yeah, there's a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, first, could you um, talk a little bit about how you decide on how diverse that, that funding, that budget portfolio should look like? The, I guess, how you would scale it between large organizations and small organizations? And then any suggestions you have for small all-volunteer organizations that can help them set up a financial set of accounts and to worry about other financial issues? I would say is as far as funding diversity, um, again, diversity is your friend. Um, one of the disadvantages of being primarily funded by the government or by a single foundation is things change. Administrations change, priorities change. You can be getting a $75,000 agreement that is the backbone of your $100,000 budget. And what happens when that goes away? That's a huge chunk and a huge piece of your program. So having a budget that's built on multiple pieces can be great. Now, obviously it's a lot easier to have uh, a $75,000 grant um, as part of your $100,000 budget. But as you're looking at your budget, look at how much am I receiving from corporations? How much am I receiving from men, membership and individuals? How much am I receiving from the government? And how much am I receiving from foundations? And is there a balance to that pie? Now, obviously, it'll never be an ideal 25, 25, 25, 25. Um, Friends of Nevada Wilderness currently, since um, about 50% of our activities are on the ground stewardship um, and our trails program. Our budget right now runs about um, 40, 45% from um, government grants and agreements and another 30% um, from foundations. And then the remaining amount is both uh, corporate grants and individual contributions. So that's kind of the diversity of our funding. As far as building um, when you're a smaller organization, what I would just say is be optimistic and set the structure up so you can build on it and add. Um, don't just make your system fit the single grant you have now or only fit federal grants and agreements. Because in the long run, you're hoping for that diversity. You're hoping for that Pew Charitable Trust to come in and add to your funding. Um, and so then it makes it a lot easier if you've already set up your systems with the idea that you are going to be expanding um, rather than modifying mid, um, midway through because you have had the growth that you have been hoping for all along. There's another question about, do you have a budget organization template that you would be willing to share or that we can make available yes. on our website? Yes, I can. Randy, I will shoot that over to you this afternoon. Okay. And um, is the 10% indirect cost rate normal for most funding organizations, I guess most uh, federal organizations? And what have you seen with other uh, foundations and um, corporate interests? So Friends of Nevada Wilderness is in a very unique and lucky position where we receive a very generous general support grant from the Wilbur Forest Foundation, which does enable us to charge the 10% de minimis because we can cover any of our other indirect costs, um, some of the um, administrative labor, things like that, with that funding. Now, I know that a fair amount of grants or a fair amount of organizations are not in that um, 
that position. And so they are looking at more of uh, particularly organizations that are staffed at the level of Friends of Nevada Wilderness with around 10 regular staff members. Um, they are looking at closer to a 15 to 20% indirect rate that they want to charge the government, which is why it becomes important to look at whether an indirect cost allocation plan will work for you or um, whether you want to do the groundwork to lay that negotiated indirect cost rate agreement and NICRA. Um, I know the, the um, Southern Appalachian Wilderness Stewardship uh, Group is right now going through the um, looking at the NICRA process because um, they want to make sure that they can charge their full indirect costs um, because they don't have the funding structure that Friends in the Nevada Wilderness has set up with that general support covering that. All right. Great. I think we're ready for the next section. Fabulous. So next we're going to talk a little about developing audit ready systems. And this is, I think, very relevant to the smaller organizations. Um, one of the disadvantages that Friends had is when we went through our first audit, we had been an organization for over 25 years. So there were 25 years of systems in place that had not been um, approved by an auditor. So some of the um, some of the things that we were doing um, were not quite what um, what our auditor had envisioned, and so one of the difficulties that I really felt as the um, finance person was changing the learned behavior, particularly when you have longtime staff members, is very if you have had people working for you for 10 years that only had to intermittently turn in receipts and suddenly you are coming down with a hammer and saying you need to turn not only every receipt in, you need to turn it in within seven days of the close of the month, that can be tough and, and it can cause some tension. Um, so one of the things that smaller organizations can do and younger organizations can do is think ahead you may not be ready for your audit. You may not be looking at an audit for another five years, but you want to work towards an audit. You want to lay the groundwork so everyone is behaving in a way that, will, that ensures controls, that money is handled properly, and that there's a paper trail because ultimately paper is your friend. You need timesheets. You need timesheets that are signed by the employee and the supervisor if you receive federal funding. A lot of us sign those federal funding agreements without reading some of that fine print. And there's a lot of obligation in there, including a lot of paperwork. Um, keeping expense reports, which track all of your employees' expenditures, and having the supporting documentation, when you sign on, on to a lot of grants and agreements, not just for federal agencies, you are also signing on to keeping that information available for your grantor. Some of your grantors are under, can undergo audits themselves. And if there's pieces of missing information, they may turn to you and they may need it. And they may need it quick. Our, uh, our agency partner um, over at the one of our BLM districts had um, misplaced a series of reports um, from all of their partners. And when they were undergoing an audit, they needed those reports within 24 hours. And luckily, because we could have copies, um, paper copies and digital copies, we were able to provide those ASAP. And that really earned us some brownie points with that BLM district. And I can tell you that when there were administrative changes and when funding became tight, we were a higher priority for funding than those groups that couldn't provide them what they needed in the timeline that they needed them in. 
make sure that you have all your hiring compensation letters. It is very important that you can prove the agreed upon amount that you are paying your employees. Um, same with contracts, as our contracted executive director, uh, Randy, uh, reminded me when we were doing a dry run of this. Um, contracts are just as important because, again, this is how you are paying people. Make sure you're keeping copies of your grants and agreements. Make sure you're referencing them. I know as conservationists, it can be hard for us to use the printer, but in the long run, it really helps lay the foundation for an audit ready, ready system to have those timesheets in the binder, to have those expense reports and the supporting documentation in those folders. And when you're setting these standards, set them early and enforce them. It can be tough um, asking your folks to do some of this paperwork when they have been hot, sweaty, removing fence out in the field. Um, it's, it's honestly the unsexy side of conservation, but it's extremely necessary. Um, when you're looking at the generally accepted accounting principles, which you'll hear referred to as GAAP, um, these refer to a common set of accepted accounting principles, standards, and procedures that companies and their accountants must follow when they compile their financial statements. Make sure that when you set up your systems, you're following GAAP. Um, make sure you're also looking at any other compliance um, as far as the IRS goes, as far as your grantors go, and as far as your state goes. Now, why are you setting up all these systems? Obviously, it's because you're a good person. You want to steward the money as well as we steward the National Wilderness Preservation System, but also because the auditors might come knocking whether you contract with them or not. As I mentioned, Friends of Nevada Wilderness goes through an independent audit. This means that we go out and we tell Conan Company, come in, look through everything, open our files, find our mistakes. There's another type of audit. This is a single audit, formerly known as an A133, and this is when the government sends people to open your drawers and go through your files. And it can be tough. Um, they're looking at, for a lot of different things. Again, you're following generally, accounting, um, generally accepted accounting principles. You have your timesheets in order, your expense reports in order, your hiring compensation letters. They'll go through your personnel files. They will look at a lot of different aspects to ensure that you have a pro an appropriate paper trail for all of your financial decisions and expenditures. Now, as far as your first audit, um, Friends of Nevada Wilderness's first audit drug on for nine months. The auditors came out seven different times. And this was an independent audit where we were paying them. You can only imagine the level of mistakes that a single audit would have uncovered, and it wouldn't have been nearly as pleasant. So I highly recommend before you get to that $750,000 threshold for federal funding in a 12 month period, look at having an independent audit look at building your financial systems and having them audited before you're forced to. It can be a big price tag, but it is extremely worth it. Um, I cannot say enough about our, um, enough good, good things about our accounting firm. They have helped us build into a powerhouse. They have helped us ensure that we have the system laid where our folks can focus on doing the best things for our public lands. And then we are doing the best things for the finance and the uh, donations that we are receiving as well. Again, it's really important that you steward your money as well as you steward your public lands and your wilderness areas. Another thing to remember as you're looking at an audit, it can be scary. It can be really, really scary that first time, but it is worth it. If you're a small organization, even just with one or two employees, start looking at whether you could do an independent audit in the next five years. Start looking at 
where you want to be and how an audit can help you get there because it is it is a very beneficial exercise. Um, it's also where you can ask for advice and really, really build a relationship with accounting professionals. Um, one of the huge benefits we've had with Cohen Company is because they have come in for the last seven years. They know us, they know our programs. They can really give us a critique that helps us build. Um, so again, asking our auditors for advice, um, I would say is the best thing Friends of Nevada Wilderness has ever done. All right, and we'll check questions. I think we're good. We can continue to the next section. So last, we're going to just go through a few year and compliance reminders. As far as taxes go, Remember, your 990s are due annually based on your fiscal year schedule. Um, for example, if your fiscal year is ending December 31st, your 990 will do, be due May 15th. Um, you can get an approved extension through August 15th and then again until November 15th. But remember, you need to get your paperwork in and you need to have it approved. You cannot submit the paperwork for an extension on May 15th. Your form will depend on your gross receipts and expenditures. If you have less than 50,000 in expenditures, you get that nice e-postcard, the 990N. If you have less than $200,000 in expenditures, you can do the 990EZ as long as your assets are less than half a million. And those of us with an operating uh, operating expenditures of over 200,000 um, or more than 500,000 in assets are looking at a full 990. Again, as you work up the ladder, um, these get tougher and tougher to complete. If you are on your e-postcard 990N, but you are expecting to grow your program, you're hoping to grow your organization, Start looking at what a 990 EZ looks like. If you're at the 990 EZ, start looking at what the full 990 looks like and start looking for an accountant to contract to do it with. The full 990 is a very complex form. And I'd just like to point out as well that a lot of your treasurers are volunteers. This is a lot of work for someone to take on, particularly when their passion is first conservation. Um, a full 990 can take um, 40 to 60 hours to complete for someone who is unfamiliar with the form and doing it for the first time. Um, so really, honestly, support your treasurer and support your finance staff and ask them as you grow, what help do you need? Is there a role for outside accounting or bookkeeping? Um, offer them the support because these are, um, these are some priority forms. And remember, if you're not filing your taxes, you can have your 501c3 status revoked. You also get a lot of fines, but ultimately you will lose your nonprofit status. And that is a big, big deal. So make sure you are complying with taxes and make sure you're supporting the treasurer and finance staff who are in charge of complying with taxes. Make sure you are meeting all your annual reporting requirements. I recommend setting up a shared calendar. Even if you are just a working board and have no staff, making sure that your chair and your treasurer are on the same page for when reports are due and what is due. Um, sometimes it can be easy for folks to write in their personal calendar a due date without realizing that there's components that they need other people other people's help on. Um, and particularly if you're all volunteers or you've got a very busy staff or you've got field staff, make sure you're calendaring those and talking about those up front and setting a schedule. And read through your agreements to make sure you know when reports are due. For example, the Department of Interior has annual SF-425s due along with 
before, or along with uh, narrative reports. Um, a lot of agreements have both financial and narrative reports due annually. So make sure you're submitting those, particularly with federal funding, because that is something auditors will look at. Are you complying with your grants and agreements? And again, if you don't know if you're complying, ask for advice. Um, ask fellow organizations, ask bigger organizations, ask fellow board members, um, ask local community foundations, ask for help. Um, a lot of folks are more than willing to give some advice. Um, we want to see the conservation community and nonprofits as a whole thrive. And the only way we can do that is working together and sharing what we've learned and um, again, stewarding our money as well as we're stewarding the National Wilderness Preservation System. All right, I'm gonna open the floor to questions. And I am not stuck. Yeah, we have a couple questions, Darcy. One is how to um, get the rest of your board to take financial compliance seriously. Um, I know that can be an issue for some boards, not understanding the rules. What would you suggest? I would suggest honest communication. Um, sometimes people don't realize what a missing receipt means or what not um, not reviewing a an agreement and giving input on. Um, and so really explaining to them this is these are the consequences for the organization if you don't do this. Um, a lot of times it can be easy to think, um, well, we're still doing good work. I remember when we went underwent our first audit. Um, our executive director was very frustrated because she asked why we can't take the auditor out into the field and show her that we we built this enclosure. Um, and that's not possible. You're you're dealing with the federal government, you're dealing with the IRS, you're dealing with a uh, different standard and really walking them through what happens when you aren't taking financial compliance seriously. If you don't file your taxes for three years as a nonprofit, your 501c3 status is automatically revoked. If you don't file your taxes on the correct form, you will get a lot of fines. You will have to do it over. And the IRS does not hold your hand. It is up to the board and the staff to support each other because the IRS honestly doesn't care one way or the other. Um, they will just keep sending you notices. They will just keep sending you fines. Um, so it's up to the board to really ensure that financial compliance is taken seriously. And again, ensuring they understand not just the, um, the consequences for them as a board member, but also the um, consequences for the organization as a whole. I think another question is how can NWSA provide or interact, communicate with other organizations to share advice on financial issues? And I would just offer that um, as the uh, facilitator of wilderness stewardship groups around the country, if there are questions of a financial nature, we can help um, provide that linkage to other groups. We can help seek out the answers from folks that are part of the NWSA membership as well as the other organizations that are out there that we interact with. So we can certainly act as a facilitator to, to make those connections and to seek those answers you might have. And um, so Darcy, one other question is, how do you suggest um, as highest priority abilities of accounting firm or service? So what's the best way to communicate between the staff and accounting when not working together in the same space? And what, the, what are those highest priorities for developing um, an accounting firm or service? I'd say the highest priority is 
being on the same page, honestly, um, really understanding what role you expect them to play and what information you can provide and making sure the relationship is always honest. Um, you don't want anyone who is going to necessarily overly sugarcoat. Um, you want somebody who is going to give it to you blunt. If your, if your structure is um, leaves controls open, you don't want there to be any misunderstanding. If the auditor wants and needs your timesheets to be updated to have a supervisor's signature, you want them to be very direct and blunt about that. Um, I know other nonprofits, um, by, by having somewhat of a volunteer accountant, um, that volunteer didn't necessarily feel empowered to give the level of blunt advice that sometimes accountants need to give. And so making sure you have an open line of communication where they feel like they can critique you, I would say is an extremely high priority. And then again, um, as far as communication goes, setting those roles and expectations so everyone is on the same page. Um, one of the biggest places for miscommunication in financial systems is if you think someone is either doing something or not doing something. Um, and you are, um, and you find out about it way too late. Um, so really making sure that folks are on the same page as far as their roles, and then they know who to communicate with if they run into issues with that role. So Darcy, we're near the top of the hour. Do you have any closing comments before we end? You know, um, I would say again, um, ask questions. Um, it's, it's again about developing a system that works for your organization and that works um, for your funders and is in compliance with the IRS and the state in any funding requirements. Um, I referred to our grants guide and our um, controls narrative and role process. Randy, I can provide those with you as uh, examples so organizations can kind of have a foundation and maybe use those as a template. Um, and then if folks have any questions, feel free to email me. Great. We will put those on our website um, under our NWSA webinars as, as resources that are available. So thanks so much again today, Darcy, for being our guest speaker, for all the great information that you've provided to our audience. Um, on behalf of the National Wilderness Stewardship Alliance and the Partnership for the National Trail System, we want to thank everybody for joining us today. We hope that you found this presentation both informative and useful. And our special thanks again to, to Darcy from Friends of Nevada Wilderness. We hope that you'll consider joining us again on January 8th at 10 o'clock Pacific time, where our guest will be Mike Ilmeni from the U.S. Forest Service, who will be online to discuss the Wild Spotter program and how volunteer groups can use this cloud-based invasive species survey tool. It's an app on a smartphone to assist in identifying invasive species in their wilderness areas. That'll help with wilderness stewardship performance. It will also help uh, keep track of where invasive species are and help plan um, treatment for those, those areas. So we're looking forward to that with Mike. Thanks again, everybody. Appreciate it. Signing off from the National Wilderness Stewardship Alliance. Goodbye. Okay.